Hi, I'm Mark Kaparaskis with Xamarin University, and this is Android 102 Activities and Intents. Please download the course materials. You'll find there's a start here.html document that has links to all the pieces of the materials. So overview here at the top, and then a link to the lecture materials, followed by links to each one of the exercises and at the bottom, suggested reading. Each one of the exercises has complete descriptions here. So for example, if I click through on exercise number two, there's a description followed by step-by-step -step instructions. For most of the parts, there's also code. For part one, it's just a, a demo, so there's no solution. But starting with part two, we actually have code supplied. Part two has starter code and completed code. The remaining parts just have completed because they build on this starter code here that you started with in part two. A common way to describe an Android application is a collection of activities that work together to achieve the goals of the app. And that's the topic in, of this course. So for example, we're gonna have an application with multiple activities inside, and one activity is gonna start another one. When the started activity is done, it's gonna call finish to return control back to the original. We'll also talk about the data flow. For example, when you're starting a new activity, you can put together a bunch of arguments and pass those across. If, if the activity does a job for you where it gathers information, it can package all that data up and send it back to the invoker. And finally, we'll, we'll talk about how to start an activity that's not part of our application. So for example, you could start the phone dialer or um, start the compose activity to let the user send an email. So our first objective is to start an activity that's part of our application that is one that's packaged inside our APK. To do that, we'll create what's called an explicit intent. And an intent is the request that we send over to Android to start the activity. And explicit just means we name the activity exactly. We explicitly identify the activity that we wanna start. And once we have the intent ready, we can go ahead and start the activity. So this is a common thing to do. It's extremely normal to have an application that has multiple activities inside it where one activity starts another one inside that application. In fact, this is, this is so normal. It's just the, one of the most common things you'll probably do as far as uh, navigation is concerned inside your Android application. Before we dive into the slides here, I'd like to just take a, a minute to explore the completed lab exercise just to give you an idea of what it is that you'll be coding. So this will be the end point of the entire course. So I'm going to go over here to the course materials and go to part six and the completed application. There's a solution file in here. And our goal here is to explore the behavior of this application. In particular, we would like to look at all the transitions between activities and, and think about not only the transitions themselves, but the data flow between them. So this application is a grocery list. And the user interface, as you can see, is, is extremely simple. There's a little bit of mock data hard-coded into the application. So when I start off here, I click on the first button, Items, and I navigate to a different activity that lists the current items in my shopping list. If I touch on one of the items here, I go to a Details page that shows me more detailed information about that shopping item. Down at the bottom, I can touch the Back button to return to the previous activity. 
So each of these navigations is a activity to activity navigation. When I click the back button again, I go back to the main activity. The second button here, add item, if I touch that, this will let me uh, add a new item to the list and I can save it and then if I go over to the items list there's my new item. This last button about just has some text sort of fake text and at the bottom there's another button when I touch this, this bottom button here, learn more, I navigate outside of my application to another activity. And in this case, it's one that's part of the core Android application set, the web browser. So I've left my application programmatically and launched a system activity. If I touch the back button, I go back to my application, back again, and I'm, I'm at my main menu. Final thing to think about is the data flow here. So if I go into items and then touch one of these items in my shopping list, there's gonna be a little bit of information passed between this activity and the one that I'm starting. So for example, if I touch the second item here, I'll navigate to the details view. What had to flow across that, that activity to activity boundary is the identity of the item that the details view should display. So it could have been the actual information like the name and the count, or it could have been an ID. If you pass across an ID, then the details view here has to look up the information in, in your data store based on that ID. And that's, that's the more common scenario. And the last piece of data flow here, when you add a new item and touch the save button, typically what you're gonna do in this case is send these two pieces of information back to whoever invoked you. And then they will add the new values to the data store. Certainly there's other architectures, but that's what we're gonna do in, in this case. So I touch save, those two values flow back to the main activity. It's gonna add the new item to the shopping list. And if I go to the items list, there is my new item. To start an activity, there's a couple of types that you need to know about that, that come to you from the Android operating system. The first one is a context. So when you start an activity, you're actually sending a request to Android. And that request goes through your context. That request is packaged as an intent object, and it is Android that starts the activity for you in response to the request. So we're gonna have to look at what is a context, what is an intent, and then once we have those behind us, we can see how to actually use the intent to start a new activity. So context is a fairly important concept in Android development. It's something that you'll see a lot throughout your time with Android. It, it provides access to operating system services. So for example, if you wanted to do something like uh, access your network connections, determine if you're in flight mode, right, airplane mode or not, um, if you wanted to show a notification, right, any, any kind of operating system service like that, you go through the context to access it. Context also lets you find out information about your own app. Things like uh, install location, uh, description, uh, minimum targeted Android version, stuff like that. If you ever needed to do that programmatically, you can do it. It also gives you access to the resources and assets that are packaged with your app. So, so these are things like images that were included in the resources folder or the assets folder, and then included in your APK file when you built your app. And for a final example, 
at runtime, you get a, an on-device file system that you can use. So there's a, a special folder if you needed to store a database file, for example, another special folder if you needed to cache some data that Android might uh, remove if it runs out of disk space. So stuff like that. And again, if you need access to that, you once again go through your context. So, so the theme here really is context is your entry point, your access point to the Android operating system. And most of the services that you get from Android will come to you through your context. So context is so important that activity inherits from context. So as an activity, you are a context and all those services that we just discussed are available to you as inherited members. An intent is the thing that you use to start an activity. And in fact, it's a, it's, you can think of it as a request. So you, in your activity, you create an intent object. So intent is a class. You create it, you load a bunch of information into it, and then you send it off to Android. Android looks at what you put inside the intent and then decides which activity to start for you. And then, and then it's Android that actually starts the activity. You don't do it directly. We're going to use something called an explicit intent. And an explicit intent is just an intent where you identify which activity you want to start. So you're being very prescriptive here to Android. You're saying, when you send Android this intent, you're saying, I know what I want. I want activity two or, or my details activity or my about activity. I know exactly which activity I want to start and I'm going to tell you which one to start for me. So here's the in intent constructor that you typically use for this. The, the constructor has a second parameter that's a type object. And you just pass in type of your activity, right? The activity that you want to start. And that's, the, that's what makes this intent explicit. There's also a first parameter, which is a context, which we just talked about. So this is a context that's part of the, the APK file that contains the um, activity that you want to start. And, and we're going to be starting here in this first section, we're starting activities within our same application. So if we're in one activity that's part of our application, our activity is a context. And we're starting another activity in that same application. Then the first activity, since it is a context, can fill the role of that first parameter. Because, of course, it is also a context that's associated with the target activity that we're about to start. Once you have your intent ready, you can call start activity. So, so again, notice this is coming from context. This is starting activities is an operating system service, and that's coming to you from context. So your activity is a context. So this start method, the, the two start methods here are things that you inherit as an activity. So you can see the first version there, start activity takes an intent. So you create the intent and then call start activity, pass along the intent. That second one is just a convenience method. See how it takes a type object? And it just saves you a couple of lines of code. Internally there, they just create an intent and, and, and send it off to Android for you. There's a lot of other methods if you poke around in uh, activity and context, you'll see a bunch of overloads for, for different situations for, for managing activities. But these two, the ones that we're looking at here, are the most common for the, um, the, the sort of the most uh, likely scenarios that you'll encounter, at least when you're first starting out with Android. So typically, you're going to start a new activity in response to a user action. For example, if you have like a list of items, if the user touches one of the items in the list, you're going to want to navigate to the details view for that list item. So you would probably put this code to start an activity in something like a click handler. And, and that's what we're showing here on this slide. So this is pretty typical. It doesn't have to be this way, but it's pretty common. You start an activity in response to a user action. So notice this, this code is running inside an activity. So we have activity one starting activity two. So the first parameter here is this, right? That first parameter has to be a context associated with the 
APK file where activity two lives. Well, activity one and activity two are in the same APK file, so I can use activity one here as the context. And the second parameter is the type object for activity two. That's what makes this an explicit intent. We are exactly identifying to Android the activity we would like it to start for us. And then we call start activity. This is another method that we inherit here uh, from our activity base class and pass along the intent object. So that brings us to our first individual exercise. Here I am in start here.html. So this is our first real coding exercise. It is exercise number two. In exercise number one, we just explored the completed application. So if I click through this link here for, for exercise number two, the first thing you'll see is a description uh, of the exercise with a nice diagram of the structure of the application. Each one of those blue boxes is an activity. So we have main activity, items activity, details activity, and so on. Most of the code is supplied for you. So in part two resources, start grocery list, there's a solution file here that has most of the application code already completed inside it. The arrows in this diagram are the transitions between activities, and those transitions are missing from the start. So, so that application, the solution file that's provided, you have all the activities themselves completed, however, the transition points where one activity starts another, where you pass data between them. None of that code is written, and that's the code that you'll be adding during the course. In this first exercise, your task is to complete those three red arrows. And, and basically, you're looking at the click handlers for the three buttons here in the main activity, and in response to the user action, you'll be launching these different activities here. So again, all the UI, most of the code behind is completed. The click handlers for those buttons is there and it's just stubbed out empty, waiting for you to add code to navigate to these uh, other activities. So if you'd like to, please go ahead and pause the video, work through the exercise on your own, and then come back when you're done and we'll go through the solution. Here I have the starter code. There are the click handlers for the three buttons that we're working on right now. So the first one, on items click, that we need to launch the items activity. And you can see right here in the solution explorer, right, there's something called items activity. If I open that up, you can see there's a class named items activity. So back to the click handler. So I'm going to create a new intent. So you can see how there's a lot of constructors. We're going to use the one that we talked about. The first parameter is a context. We're in an activity, so we are a context. And the second parameter is a type object. So type of items activity. Now we're also, since we're also an activity, we inherit the start activity method. Again, notice there's a few overloads. We're going to use, again, the one we talked about. So I pass in the intent here. And that's it. For the second step, we're going to do essentially the same thing, except we're going to start the add item activity. And just to save myself some typing, I will copy and paste. And the only difference here is the type of the activity we're creating. And finally, in the third, we're just going to use the overloaded start method. That's a convenience. Right, remember, there's one that takes a type object, so we can say type of about activity. And that just saves us this one line of code. Behind the scenes, this method probably just creates an intent just like we did up here, but we don't have to do it. 
and, and you don't need to put the word base on there, right? It's just, I just did that to emphasize that this is a method that we inherit from our activity base class. And now if I run this, my three buttons in my main activity should now work. So if I touch that, I navigate to the items activity, back button, there's add item, back, and finally, about. So in this first part, we saw how to start an activity in our own application. And the, again, this is one of the most common things that you'll do when you're implementing navigation in Android. A lot of the discussion here was about context and intent, which are things that you'll see a lot more of as you keep working uh, with Android. Remember, your context is your entry point or your access point for most Android operating system services. And then an intent is a request to Android for it to start an activity for you. Next, we're going to talk about how to programmatically end an activity. Most of the time, you won't need to do this. You have built into Android a back button, and the behavior of the back button is to end the current activity and return you to the previous one. But there are a few cases where that's not enough. Uh, the, the classic ones are when you want to implement buttons like save or cancel. So in those cases, you need a little bit deeper understanding of what's happening uh, when you navigate between activities. So we'll start here with a, a discussion of stack navigation, then talk more, in, more formally about what the back button does, and finally see how to finish an activity uh, in code. So, so again, here's sort of the classic case. The add contact activity has a button that says discard changes. So when the user touches that button, the add contact activity ends itself programmatically and then returns control back to the previous activity. And the reason this is interesting is because the, the, the behavior in this case of the back button might be non-intuitive or ambiguous for the user. Suppose the user comes to the screen and they start entering information and they get about halfway done and then they touch the back button. What's the meaning of the back button in that case? Does it save the data or does it discard? So since that's left unspecified, this app chose to provide a specific button that in this case implemented the cancel operation. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the concept of navigation and in particular stack navigation. So first a definition. The term navigation means the paths, the, the transitions you set up between activities in your application. So for example, here I have the, a couple of screenshots from the Contacts app. I have my All Contacts view on the left. If I touch one of the contacts, I navigate to the Details activity for the Contacts, contacts application. So, so the sum total of these kind of transitions make up the navigation for your application. Built into Android is something called the Back button. And it might be hardware or software. Down there at the bottom, right, you see the, on the left hand side, you see the back button. The back button ends the current activity and returns the user to the previous one. And, and again, many times this is sufficient for the back navigation that you might need to implement in your app. There's three common architectural patterns that you might see in Android apps as far as navigation goes. Stack navigation, that's the one we're going to talk about here. Uh, tab navigation, you can see on the top there, there's some tabs in the, in the, um, the clock app. And then navigation drawer and, and the maps app, you can see that that's a slide out navigation panel there that lets the user choose from a, a long list of different, different navigation options. Again, in this course, we're just going to talk about stack navigation and other courses talk about these other options. So stack navigation is a navigation pattern where when the user moves from one activity to another, the history list of the activities that are currently in process is maintained in, in what's called a stack data structure. So as I navigate here, perhaps I have a, a, an app that displays a list of articles over here. I touch one of the articles. 
and I go to the details page for that article. At the bottom there's a little information about the author. I touch that and I go to the author's information page. So right now all three of these activities are live. They're, they're sort of halfway executed. If I touch the back button, I return back to the previous activity that I was on, touch the back button again, and go back to that first activity. Behind the scenes there is a stack that's recording this sequence and it's called the back stack. This is something that Android maintains automatically for you. So I start off there as activity one, I navigate to the details view for the activity, you can see the, the second activity got added to the stack, I navigate to the author details page, that activity gets added to the stack, touch the back button, and the topmost activity gets popped off the stack, we get returned to the one that's immediately below that, in this case activity two. Repeat that cycle here, and we're back to activity one. It's possible that the activities that you are currently using in an app don't all come from your application. And in cases like that, those activities, the, the activities that are on the back stack, may come from multiple applications. So for example, on the left we have the, a screenshot from the contacts app. So we're looking at an individual contact and we, we know their phone number. If we touch their phone number there, we navigate to the phone application. And, and again, those two things, those two activities are from different applications and they're, they both are living on the back stack. So the back stack is maintained for you by Android automatically. And generally, there's nothing you have to do to interact with it. If you call start activity, so here I am, I have activity one, and I'm calling start activity for activity two. Activity two automatically gets added to the back stack for us. When the user touches the back button, Android automatically removes activity two, in this case, from the back stack and automatically returns the user to the previous activity, in this case activity one. So in general, when you're doing stack navigation, you're going to start activities, but many times you don't need to end them. When the user is done working with an activity, they'll just touch the back button and that'll automatically return them to the previous activity. There are a couple of cases where that might not work for you. And one of the classic ones is if you want to implement functionality like save or cancel. In that case, you in an activity might want to say to Android, okay, I'm done, please end me, pop me off the back stack and return the user back to the previous activity. And to do that, you just call your finish method. So this is a method that you inherit as an activity. So here's a quick example. Notice I have it in, in what looks like a click handler because I'm trying to motivate that this might be something like a handler for a button that was the, your cancel button. Or if you had a save button, you might have on save click and then have a little bit more work here ahead of time where you actually save the user's data and then called finish. Right? In either case, it's that call to finish that, that finishes your activity, you're done running code, pops you off the, the back stack and sends the user to the previous activity. So this is exercise three. It's very short, it's just one line of code. Call uh, finish when the user clicks on the cancel button in the add item activity. So if you'd like to work through this on, their, on your own, please go ahead and pause the video and then come back when you're done. So here we are in the add item activity. We're going to be working here in the on cancel click handler. There's also on save click, but we don't know how to save and return the data yet. So we're going to avoid that one for the moment. We'll do that in a later exercise. So our goal for now is just to implement on cancel click. We're writing code inside an activity here, so we inherit a finish method. So we can call finish. Now when the user clicks the cancel button, this activity will end, it will get popped off the back stack and return the user to the previous activity. And of course the base dot 
isn't necessary, it's just personal preference. If I run this, I go to the add item activity, add a new item, but then click the cancel button. So notice that activity ended because we called finish. And of course, we didn't implement the save functionality, so our new item did not get added to our grocery list. So in this section, we spent most of our time talking about some concepts around navigation, in particular, stack navigation and the back button. And most of the time, the automatic navigation will be good enough for you. If you're doing stack navigation in your app, all you do is start activities. The user will use the Android back button when they're done with an activity and want to go back to the previous one. But there are some cases where that's not sufficient, and we saw two here. That was the cancel button, that's the one we coded, and we also talked a little bit about the save button, which we'll implement later. Next we're going to talk about passing arguments to an activity. There's two sides to this. In the source activity, we're going to load all our arguments into a bundle, and then put that bundle into the intent that we use to launch the target. That intent gets taken by Android and passed to the target activity. So when the target activity starts up, that intent with the bundle inside is available. And of course then in the target, typically in its onCreate method, right, during its initialization phase, it'll reach into the intent that started it, grab the bundle, and pull out the arguments. There is a bit of theory that we have to do before we reach that code. We're going to talk about activities and process boundaries because it turns out that there, there are cases when we're passing arguments to an activity that the target activity is running in a different process. And if we understand that idea, it, the, the limitations on what you're allowed to pass should make more sense. So for motivation, there's a lot of cases where one activity starts another and needs to pass across information about what the target activity should do. Here's a simple example. You have contacts. On the left-hand side, you have a list of all your contacts. When you touch a contact, the details view opens. The, of course, the all contacts view has to pass across information about which contact the details view should display. And there's, of course, a couple of ways to do this. The most common thing to do would probably be pass across an ID and then the details view could look up the contact information based on that ID. Uh, another architecture would be to just have the all contacts view, load the actual values, and pass all of them across. Android is based on Linux. Each app runs in its own Linux process. For example, here I have two applications. I have contacts on the left and phone on the right. Those two apps are running in their own separate processes. And that's true even when they work together. So if, suppose I had the contacts app running first, and I touched a phone number, and, and then the contacts app launched the phone app. Right? I still have behind the scenes two processes, each of these running in their own process. And just generalizing that idea a little bit, each app has a process, and all the activities that are part of that app run in that app's process. So what this means for us in this discussion is that when we launch an activity and we pass across information, it's possible that in some cases that data is going to flow across process boundaries. And one process cannot access the address space of another process. They're sandboxed. And that means you're not allowed to pass an object reference from one activity to another. And that limitation is true even when the two activities are running in the same process. So in general, right, the, the statement is you can't pass object references. You have to flatten your objects. So you can pull out integers and strings and, and a bunch of primitive types and pass those individual values across but you can't pass an object reference. So the, the thing that actually, the data structure that actually flows across the um, activity to activity boundary is called a bundle. So a bundle is a class. You can think of it analogous to a dictionary. It's a collection of key value pairs. The keys are strings, 
You don't have any choice in that. You have a little bit of flexibility on the type of the values, but generally it's the simple types, the primitive types. The bundle class has a bunch of put and get methods. The ones that I have on the slide here are some of the most common, put int and get int, put double, get double, and so on. And you, and you can see the types that I'm working with there are the, the, what you think of as the simple types or the primitive types. So you have support for integers, floating point, boolean, character, string, and so on. There's also some methods that I'm not showing that, that have uh, collections, like arrays and lists of integers, arrays and lists of doubles, and so on. But, but still, fundamentally, it's what you think of as the simple types or the primitive types. If you do need to use a, a pass all the data inside an object, you can manually flatten it, so pull out the, the property values and load them individually into a bundle, or you can have your object implement either of these two interfaces, Android's parcelable interface and Java's serializable interface. And if you do either of those, then you can load your objects into a bundle. But of course, when you call something like put parcelable, your object will be flattened, will be serialized according to the parcelable interface. And what gets sent across is the serialized version of your object, not the actual object reference. So we're not going to talk about the details of how to implement either of those interfaces. They're, the parcelable one especially can, has uh, quite a bit of code to it, so we have instead some samples there if you ever need to do this. So now we know what a bundle is and we know how to load one. Right? We know what's allowed inside. So the next step is to talk about how that interacts with the idea of an intent. So an intent has built into it a property named extras, which is a bundle. So you create a bundle, load it into the intent as the intent's extras, and then that gets carried along across the boundary from one activity to another when you launch the intent. In the target activity, that intent, that whole big green or blue arrow there with the green uh, bundle inside, that whole thing is available. Activity, the activity class has a property named intent, which is the intent that started it. So inside the target, you can just say base.intent dot extras to access that collection of key value pairs. So here I am in the source activity and I'm about to launch another activity and I need to load up the arguments. So there's two ways to do it. The first one there is a little bit more verbose. I manually create the bundle, load it up, you see put int, right? So that's like setting a key value pair in there. And then once I have all the arguments in the bundle, I load the bundle into the intent, and, and that's the call to put extras. So that's one way to do it that's perfectly valid. It's just a little bit more code than you need. Intent offers some convenience methods so that you don't have to explicitly create the bundle and load it and so on. So for example, down there at the bottom, intent.putExtra. So that internally creates the bundle if needed and then loads that key value pair into it. So that shorthand is, is uh, in my opinion, the more common route that most people take. And now here we are on the target side. So the, the target activity receives the intent. In fact, let me go back to the last slide for just a moment. So this intent object that I'm creating here, when I say new intent, right, I'm gonna call start activity and pass this intent object as the, the parameter to start activity. Android will launch the target activity and make that intent available to it in this property. So the property is named intent and the class is named intent, right? but this is, this is in fact a property name here. If you are an activity, you inherit it, see the base on the front, and this would typically be done in the target activities on create method. So just when it's getting up and running, it may need to pull the uh, arguments out and, and use those to, to help set itself up. So there's two ways to do it, two ways to retrieve the value. This first way is the verbose way. So I go to the intent object and then move inside to the bundle, the extras, and then I call the get whatever method on the bundle. 
The second way is a shorthand, and, and again, in my experience, the shorthand is generally preferred by people just because it's a little bit less code to write. And this is a method on the intent class that accesses the internal bundle for you. So it's time to do another exercise. You're working on exercise number four, pass arguments to an activity. So it's this red line right here. You're going to be working in the items activity and the details activity. So there's two signs to this. In the items activity, when the user touches one of the items in the list, you need to create an intent, load a, an ID number into the intent extras, and then start the details activity. In the details activity, you need to retrieve that ID value from the intent extras and then use it to populate your user interface here. As usual with this lab, a lot of the code's been pre-written for you. So this entire list of items here and the, the um, event handler has been installed so that when the user touches one of the items, there's already a stubbed out method that executes. So your job is to implement that method to create the intent, navigate to the details activity. In the details activity, your job is to work on the onCreate method to retrieve the ID value that was passed across. Once you do that, there's, there's already some code to take that ID value that you provide and populate the user interface. So if you'd like to work through this on your own, please go ahead and pause the video and then come back whenever you're done. So here I am in the items activity. So this is the source activity. And we're working in the item click handler here. So this has already been attached to the list of items. You can see the plus equals right here. That's the subscription. So we're going to be notified when the user touches one of the items in that list view. Inside the event args, we receive the position in the list of the touched item. And we're going to use that as our ID number to pass across to the um, details activity. The first thing we need to do is create an intent. So that's code we've seen before. And then we call the put extra method. See there's a bunch of overloads for all the simple types plus arrays and lists of simple types. First parameter is the key. It doesn't really matter what you choose for the key as long as you agree and use that same string in the target activity. And the second parameter is the actual value. So once we have the extra loaded, we just call start activity. This entire intent object here gets passed over to the target activity, which in this case is the details activity. So let's go over there next. So here's details activity. It is a activity, so it inherits an intent property. There's the intent property. So that is the intent object that we just created a moment ago. And there's a method inside there called get int extra. Again, that's the shorthand method. I could also do intent dot extras.getInt. So either way. There's two parameters. First one is the key. And the second one's a default value in case the key is not found. I'll just pass in minus one here. So there we retrieve the position of the item that the user touched, and we use that to access into our behind the scenes data store. And this is this is essentially just a global variable, main activity dot items. It's a static field inside the main activity class that stores our grocery list so that all our items, all our activities can access all our items. So we use that as the position into this list retrieve the value for the grocery item. And again, notice we're just passing across an int, which is essentially an ID number. We're not actually passing across 
the object because we can't. And then once we have the item, we can look inside at its properties and use those to populate our user interface. So if I run this, I go to the items list and then I touch on one of the items. So let me do it on the second item. So the index or the position will be one because I have zero, one, and two. So I touch on that item. We navigate to the details activity. We pass across the position one in this case, and that gets used to populate the user interface here. So in this section, we looked at how to pass arguments to an activity and then in the target activity, how to retrieve them. We did spend some time on theory here. We talked about activities and their process affinity. And the reason we did that was, was mostly just so that it's more intuitive to understand the limitations on what you're allowed to pass from the source to the target activity. In particular, it's a very common thing in Android when you're first starting out to assume or want to pass an object reference. But you're just not allowed to do that. You can pass simple types. You can pass serializable or parcelable types and they will get serialized and the serialized form gets passed from one activity to another. So knowing that behind the scenes, launching an activity and passing arguments could traverse a process boundary helps understand why that limitation is in place. Next, we're gonna code an activity that returns data back to the one that started it. So there's a couple of things to do here. We're gonna have two activities again, a source and a target, and, and the source is gonna launch the target. The source is gonna pass across a request code, and then automatically Android will pass that same request code back from the target back to the source when the target finishes. That's gonna let the source activity identify who the results are coming from. Next, we're gonna have the target activity return two things. A, a flag that says success or failure, that's the result code, and then a bunch of data inside a bundle. And finally, back in the source activity, we're going to do some error checking, make sure that we're, we're getting the request code we expect, make sure that the result code is okay, and then once, once we do our error checking, we'll pull the data out of the bundle. So the motivation here is pretty straightforward. You have two activities involved, a source and a target. The source activity launches the target activity and asks the target to do some work for it. And in some ways you can think of it as roughly analogous to a method call where, where you call, call the method, pass some arguments across, it does some work for you and then sends back the results. Here's an overview of the data flow. That first bit, intent extras, that's the part we already talked about, right? That's the source activity creating a bundle loading it up with everything the target needs and then passing that across. So we're not really gonna talk about that bit anymore. All the rest of those things there though, those, those are new. Notice the next thing in the list there is request code. So that gets sent from the source to the target and then that same code gets sent back to the source. You can see it there on the arrow facing to the left. And, and that return of the request code happens automatically, there's nothing Nothing you can do, nothing you have to do to make that happen. And we'll see what that's for in just a second. Those other two values that are flowing back, those are, those are I think more intuitive. There's the result code that indicates success or failure. And then there's a bundle that is the actual data the target is sending back to the source. So notice that there's intent extras at the top and intent extras at the bottom. Those are different things and they're actually different intent objects. On the top is the intent object the source created to launch the target. On the bottom is a completely different independent intent that the target created. So the target's gonna say new intent and then do put extras to load up the bundle. So, so some of the code we'll see will look familiar, but, but that intent object in the extras is completely unrelated to the, to the intent that was used to start the target. Here's the methods that you're gonna use. First at the top, notice that we're not calling start activity anymore. So the source, when, when, it, when it launches the target, it now calls start activity for result. And the difference of course is that the, the source is expecting a callback when the target is finished. 
in the target, you call a method named setResult to load those, those two values we talked about, the error code, like the success or failure flag, and then the actual data. So the setResult method takes those two parameters, and then when your activity ends, Android automatically invokes a callback in the source, and, and that's named on activity result. So the source activity has to override the on activity result method and then it receives the data from the target. So we've done the overview, now let's start into the details. The first thing to discuss is this idea of request code. Suppose the source activity had a couple of different activities that it started. So here I have target one and target two. If the source uses start activity for result to start activity one and to start activity two, when those two activities finish, they're going to invoke behind the scenes sort of automatically, I guess Android will do it, they're going to invoke the on activity result method in the source. And it's, there's just that one method in the source that gets invoked when either target one or target two finishes. So the source activity needs some way to determine who the, the results are coming from. And that's what the request code is for. So there's no intrinsic meaning to those values. Like the numbers 100 and 200 are values that I just made up. So it's completely up to you what values you use there. It's just an integer. So for example, here I pass 100 to target one. In my sources on activity result, I'm going to get the, that request code back, and I can just write an if statement. If request code equals 100, then I know these, this set of results is coming from activity 1. Else, if request code equals 200, I know the set of results is coming from activity 2. Right? And like I said, that request code makes the round trip. And there's nothing that you and the target have to do to make that happen. In fact, you, you have no control over it. You, you do, you receive the request code, and then Android packages it up and sends it back to the source when, when you finish. Right? In the source activity, we're going to call that method start activity for result. So notice this is a variant of start activity. It does take an intent as we might expect. That's normal. When you start an activity, you pass an intent. The new bit is when you, when you add the little for result on the end, you then have to supply a request code. All right, so that was request code. Next is result code. And this is a, a condition flag. It's fairly intuitive, actually, the, the core idea anyway. When, when you invoke an activity to do some work for you, the activity tells you whether it succeeded or failed. And that's, that's all the result code is for. It's just an enumeration that says OK or canceled. And this is something that the target activity has to explicitly set, because they have to decide, did I succeed or did I fail? So there's, there's two real values here, OK and canceled. Okay, so again, this is an enum result code, and the target activity will, will call set result and pass uh, result.ok or result.canceled. So that's pretty intuitive. There is another value that's less intuitive. It's called first user. This is in case you want to use custom values, values that aren't OK or canceled. So remember, this is an enum, and enums are based on integers. So first user is the integer value within the enum that's the first integer value that you're allowed to use. So you know that any integer value equal or greater than first user will not interfere with these two other values OK and canceled. So this is completely up to you if you want to use different result codes outside of the, those two standard ones, OK and canceled. Just make sure you, you use an integer value that's greater than or equal to first user. All right, the last piece of data flow is the, the actual return results. And this is something that you, you basically already know how to do. You create an intent and load the intent extras full of whatever key value pairs you would like. And just as before, this might cross a process boundary. So we have that standard Android rule that this is intent extras, it's a bundle, you can only pass the simple types, collections of the simple types, serializable, parcelable, that kind of stuff. In the target, you call set result. 
There's two options. One, you pass just the result code, and that's the OK or canceled. The other option is you pass the result code plus an intent, and, and that's the intent full of all the data values you want to send back to the, um, to the source activity. One thing to keep in mind, in the target, calling set result does not finish the target activity. If you want to actually end the target activity, you need to include a call to finish as well. Here we are back in the source. So a source activity is an activity. You override on activity result, and you receive three things. This is first one's the request code that made the round trip to the target and then automatically came back to you. Second is the result code that's going to be OK or canceled, typically. And then the third thing is that intent with the bundle inside that has all the, re the result values that the user or the, the um, target activity is sending to you. So it's typical to do a little bit of error checking, right? Here's an if statement, checks the, the flag, and then this equal equal 100, that's just identifying which of the possibly many target activities are these result set, is this result set coming from. And if I pass that test, I can then reach into the data here and pull out the extras. So it's time for another exercise. So if you'd like to work through this on your own, please go ahead and pause the video and then come back whenever you're done. So here I am in main activity. We need to start right here with the on add item click method. When we call start activity, we need to change this now to start activity for result. And when we do that, we're required to pass in a second argument here, which is our request code. So that value comes back to us right here. So we'll probably have an if statement here. If request code equals 100, that tells us that we're, the results we're getting here are coming to us from the add item activity. Let's go over to the add item activity. Here we are in on save click. So the user has entered the new values for the grocery list item and then they've clicked save. Here we retrieve those two values from the user interface and our goal now is to send those back to the main activity. So we do that with an intent. We create the intent and load those two into the intent extras. Then we call set result. There's two parameters. The first one is the result code. So we're going to choose OK, meaning success, and then the intent. Calling set result doesn't end this activity, so we're going to add a call to finish. That'll end this activity and send us back to the main activity. So when we call finish there, back in the main activity, the on activity result method runs. Let's add some error checking here. make sure that the uh, add item activity succeeded. And then if both of those are true, we know we have data available to us. And so we come in here and pull those values out of that intent. And once we have those two values, we can then just add this new item to our collection of items. Up here we have a list of items, so we can create a new item object like this and add it to, to that list. If I run this, now I go to the add item method, type in the value for my new item, click save, and now if I go to the items list, I see coffee has been added. I touch that, go to the details view, I'll see the details for that item. So in this section we looked at how to return results from an activity. And there were three parts. 
There was the request code, which identifies the target activity when the results come back to the source. Then there was the intuitive bits, I think, where you returned a flag, like success or failure, plus some data. And then finally, in the source activity, uh, retrieving the bundle with the data and pulling it out of the intent extras. Now we're going to talk about how to launch an activity that's not part of our application. We'll still use an intent to do this, but the values that we put inside the intent in this case are going to be different than when we launched an activity from our own application. And whenever you do this, there's always the possibility that the intent that you send to Android won't have any matching activity on your, on your device. So you do need to do a little bit of error checking before you attempt to do the start. So the motivation here is, is kind of interesting actually. This is one of the most powerful features of Android, the fact that applications can work together with up other applications at the activity level. So for example, you, you can write an app and you could have inside your app a phone number somewhere and let the user touch the phone number and instead of having to write your own user interface to, to um, make a phone call, you can just launch the system activity that has like a phone dialer or, or just directly makes the phone call. And there's a couple of benefits to this. First, and, and sort of most obviously I guess, is it's much less work for you. The thing already exists on the system, you should just invoke it. Second, it gives the user a more familiar experience. They know how to dial their phone. They've used that phone dialer many times. And so this is exactly the interface they expect and they don't have to learn a new one. The activities you launch can be either inside another application or they can be part of the standard Android suite of applications. In either case, the way you do this is you create what's called an implicit intent. And the word implicit just means that you don't specify which activity should get started. You describe instead what you want done. So for example, you might say, I want to make a phone call, or I want to take a picture. That's, you're specifying the operation that you would like performed but not saying which activity should service that request. So you create an implicit intent, load it with information, send it to Android, and then Android is the one that looks at that information and chooses the activity for you. Inside your intent, there's five different things that you can load in there. There's something called an action, which is at a, at a high level, the thing that you want done. Then some data that gets passed to the target activity. For example, if you were asking for a phone call to be made, you would pass the phone number as the data. Then there's a MIME type, which is a little bit tricky. It's, it's the kind of information that the activity is going to operate on. And, and that actually does help Android decide which activity to launch for you. Then there's something called a category, uh, which is a, a sort of a high level description of the activity that you want done or what, what kind of activity it is. And then finally extras. And the extras are probably the, the easiest thing here because that's something that we've already discussed. You, when, you, when you invoke an activity you can pass extras to it in order to give the target activity more information about what you want done or give it data to operate on. So we've already seen that in practice when we pass in the intent extras an ID number from one activity to another. And then, and then on the return we passed some information generated inside an activity right back to the caller. So that's sort of the same concept that we've already talked about. So those five things we just discussed, it, this is a little bit tricky. When you're creating an implicit intent to launch something, you have to know what magic combination of those five things to load in in order to get the result that you want. And, and luckily, there, there's some pretty good documentation that's part of the standard, standard Android uh, documentation set that will, will tell you for at least many of the co most common cases exactly what you need to do. So for example, here I have a screenshot on the left side that says, here, here's what you would need to do if you wanted to show a location on a map. 
So you would create an intent and you would set the action to view and then the data to a latitude and longitude with geo colon on the front. So you just read that and you write some code to create an intent with those property values loaded. Then you send that off to Android and Android will choose a mapping application and a mapping activity to service your request. The other thing that's interesting about this discussion here is that notice there's only two things. Let me go back to the last slide here. See there's five possible things that you could load in there and here this example only needs two of them. So that's kind of an important point. You don't need to set all five of those things most of the time. There's a link to the um, some of the most common cases. So let's go through those five things one at a time. Some of them are more important than others. The, the action is probably one of the most important things. So the action is at a high level what you want done. Action is kind of variable. So for example, if you see something like an action like dial the phone, that's pretty specific. At the other extreme, there's an action like display some information for me. And that's really generic. So, so if you think of yourself as like Android processing a, an intent request, the action, if you get an action like dial the phone, life's easy, right? Because there's not that many activities that can service that kind of request. But display some information is really general and you're gonna need to look at the other values, those other four things inside the intent to help you decide what to do. And, and send a message is kinda in the middle, right? Send a message is more specific than just display some information, but of course, the question then becomes, what kind of a message do you mean? Email, text message, and so on. So, so the action by itself is usually not sufficient for Android to decide which activity to launch for you, but it does help narrow things down. So an action is a string. In the middle there, you can see what the actual string is. So android.intent.action.view. That's the actual thing that you would load into the intent, that string. That's a lot of typing and it's error prone. So instead you use the, the column on the left hand side, the symbolic constant. So inside the intent class, there's a lot of symbolic constants that start with the word action. That's how you know they're, they're used for actions inside an implicit intent. So Android's a pretty big system and new actions come along all the time and so they don't always get added to the intent class. So some actions are packaged inside other classes or I should, I should say the symbolic constants, the string values that you would use for some actions are packaged outside of the intent class. So there's an example right there, media store uh, action image capture is the action you would use to take a photo. And again, notice that's not part of the intent class. There's a couple of ways to set the action, constructor call or a set action method. Second thing is data. The intuition for data is you're giving the activity you're launching, the target activity, something that it's gonna to use to do the job for you. So if you wanna say, I wanna make a phone call, then you're gonna pass the phone number. If you wanna display information on a map, you're gonna, you're gonna specify the location. If you want the browser to show you a web page, you're gonna give it the, um, the URL. Notice though that this sounds a little bit like intent extras, at least it should. Like this is information that you're passing to an activity to help that activity do its job or giving it information for it, for it to process for you. So it does sound like it overlaps a little bit with intent extras. However, it's not your job to figure that out. Generally, the Android documentation, especially that, that web page about common intents, will generally tell you, don't use the extras for this, use the data instead. So typically, you'll just be following a recipe. So the data is a URI and it's an Android URI, android.net.uri. There's a parse, static parse method there that you can use to create one of these URIs from a string. Next is MIME type. So the MIME type, this is one of the things that helps Android decide which activity to launch for you. It indicates the kind of data that you want Android to work with for you. So if you were, if you were saying things like, something like, I would like, to display a picker to let the user choose something. 
you might set the MIME type to image. And Android would say, ah, I need to display a picker that's capable of returning an image file. This is another case where, especially when you're first starting out with this stuff, you don't have to try to reason about what these things should be. Much of the time, you'll be able to find documentation somewhere that will just tell you. So for example, the, the first couple there, insert a new contact, add a calendar event. Those are strings that I just pulled out of the Android documentation. All right, there's a little recipe that says, when you want to insert a new contact, set the MIME type to this string. And that's it. You just build an intent that matches the recipe. And there's a set type method right, that will let you set the MIME type inside an intent. Next is category. So when, when uh, uh, the author of an activity advertises their activity as something that is usable by other applications, they can optionally, this is not required, but optionally they can say, my activity falls into one or more of these categories. And there's a few examples there, preference, tab, openable, like picker, and there's, there's many more. When you, as a client, write an intent, you can put a category as part of your uh, implicit intent, and that's going to limit the activities that Android uses to try to find a match for you. So let me, let me try to say that another way. So on your device, you have a bunch of activities. So all the, all the activities on, from all the apps on your device, right, make up the set of possible activities. And now here you come along, you're, you're an application, you create an intent and you throw that over to Android and say, hey, find an, intent, find an activity that matches this intent. Right? So if your intent has a category on it, Android goes over to the pool of activities on the device and just throws most of them away, for, or just, just doesn't even consider them, takes only the ones that have a category that matches the one that you put in your intent. And then from there, it looks at the other information inside your implicit intent to try to find one within that smaller pool that matches your request. So this is not common. Most of the time, you won't need to do it. But in case, in case you do, here's how you do it. There's an add category method. And again, the intent class has symbolic constants for, for most of the common categories. And finally, intent extras. So this is probably the most intuitive thing because this is something we've already talked about. You, you know that when you create an intent, you can have extras inside it. The extras are a bundle. The bundle stores key value pairs. When you're using the extras, you're, in your application, you're loading information into an intent and then some other activity that you didn't write typically is going to try to pull those, those bits of information out. So, so the key thing here is that you and that other activity agree on the keys that get used for these intent, the intent extras in the bundle. And so to, to help that situation, Android has a bunch of symbolic constants. So on the left-hand side, for example, you can see uh, extra email. And then that's a symbolic constant. And the, the actual value of that symbolic constant is that string Android intent extra email. These are the things that you would use as the keys inside your intent extras. So you would load the bundle using those things on the left as the keys. And then when the activity that Android selected to, um, to service your request was launched, it would expect that there was data in the bundle using those same keys, so it would be able to successfully pull them out. So here's how to do uh, show a location on a map. Create the intent, set the action, set the data, and that's it. Then you, then you just call start activity and pass that intent. Now, now this particular example would require a mapping application be installed on, on your device in order to run it. But, but again, notice that this just does action and data. There's no MIME type, there's no extras, there's no category. Here's one more example. This is send an email. So you create the intent, set the action. So the action is uh, send to, and then load data. 
And, and see how that narrows down, like send to might be a text message or an email. So setting the data narrows down from generic send message to send email. And then there's a bunch of extras that are, that are optional. And there's, you know, email, the, which is the list of recipient addresses, uh, subject, and there's, there's some for the body and, and, and CC and so on. All, all the common fields that you would expect in an email message. Um, has extras defined. So you can put as many extras as you want in the intent. And again, then you just call start activity and pass in this intent. Android will select an email compose activity, start that activity, and hand it this intent. That activity will expect that these the extras have those keys, extra email, extra subject. It will pull those out, those values out of the intent, and use it to pre-populate the email compose window. You should do a little bit of error checking. When you're dealing with implicit intents, you're creating an intent, you're putting stuff in it, and then it's kind of like you're throwing it over a wall, right? You're throwing it over to Android, and Android then tries to, to look inside your intent and find a match, find an activity that satisfies all the, the, the stuff that you put into your request. And, and there's a chance that it might not find one. So when you're, when you're using implicit intents, it's always a good idea to do a little bit of testing, a little bit of error checking before you call start activity. So you are an activity typically, right? Most of the time you're writing code inside an activity. Since you're an activity, you inherit a property called package manager. So that, that package man manager property gives you an instance of the package manager. And that's the thing that knows about all the activities on the device. So you can say resolve activity. So resolve activity is a method on intent and it takes a package manager and basically it just runs its resolution algorithm trying to find a match. So package manager knows all the activities on the device and the intent has all the data inside it that you loaded, right? The action, um, the extras, the mime type, all that stuff. So the intent just runs its resolution algorithm looking through the activities the package manager knows about to see if it finds a match. And you know, you get back null or not depending on if it found a match. So, so it's generally a good idea to do this check before you call start activity. So for the exercise here, it's, it's, this is our final exercise and it's a, it's a relatively short one. This is just launch the web browser. So in the grocery list application, you'll be in the about activity. There's a button in there that says learn more. And your goal is to, when, when the user clicks that button, to take them to the Xamarin website. So if you'd like to work through that on your own, please go ahead and pause the video and then come back when you're done. So here I am in the about activity and we're just writing code in the handler here on learn more click. And the web browser, it's a fairly simple one. So you create an intent. There is a constructor here that takes the action. So I could do intent.action view like that. Or I could do intent.setAction, intent.actionView. So either way, the next thing I want to do is set the data. So when you're invoking the web browser, you need to pass in as the data the web address that you'd like to load. And then just call start activity. So go to the about page, touch the learn more button. That intent goes off to Android. Android uses the action and the data in this case to try to find a, an activity that matches our request. It finds one, in this case it finds the web browser activity, launches the, that activity for us. And of course the intent that we create here gets passed to that target activity. So the target activity can reach inside that intent, pull out the data value, which is the URI, and then load that web page for us. In this section, we created what's called an implicit intent, which again is one that doesn't name explicitly the activity you want to start. So in an, in an explicit intent, you pass the type object. 
that explicitly or exactly identifies the activity that you'd like to start. In this situation, that's not true. You create an implicit intent and you don't name the activity you want to start. Instead, you load in some combination of action, data, extras, category, and so on. And then Android uses that information to find an activity that's capable of, search, of, of servicing your request. And of course, in this kind of situation, there's always the possibility that you get your, your magic combination of, of property settings off just a little bit and Android won't be able to find an activity that matches. Or, or of course, there just might not be an activity that matches installed on the, on the end user's device at runtime. So it's always a good idea to check beforehand uh, with the resolve activity method right, before you, you attempt to launch an implicit intent. That brings us to the end of Android 102 Activities and Intents. Again, my name is Mark Kaparaskis, and there's my email address if you have questions. Thank you very much for watching.